you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Alright, so you know the amazing benefit to patient care and how much more you just enjoy your practice when you're good at ultrasound. Yeah, it's obvious to us that bedside ultrasound isn't the future, it's the present. And we're stoked that you're listening to this and trying to take better care of your patients and be a better doctor. But do you ever wonder, is this good enough? You know, podcasts and learning solely through multimedia instruction? Is something missing? Whether or not you wonder it, that's our fear. We've tried really hard with podcasts, apps, interactive iBooks, file sharing sites, and all these resources to give you the best education we can without actually ever meeting you. But let's face it, this isn't how the three of us learned ultrasound. I totally think you can learn ultrasound this way, but there's something to be said for a traditional fellowship model that we completed and the personal mentorship that comes along with that. Right, and as fellowship directors, we really believe that there's no substitute for personal mentorship and one-on-one -on -one time. In fact, it's been bothering us enough that we've decided it's a problem that we want to solve. So let us tell you about the Ultrasound Leadership Academy. We're going to combine all the best parts of newer models, such as asynchronous learning through multimedia education and the traditional model of university-based ultrasound fellowships to create an incredibly rich, immersive, year-long experience that turns ultrasound novices into ultrasound masters. Obviously, we can't personally do this for all the podcast listeners, but we can do it for a few. So that's the goal. We're going to pilot this idea we have and accept a few adventurous doctors to be the inaugural class of our Ultrasound Leadership Academy. Just to be clear, this isn't a casual course. This is going to consist of hundreds of hours of education and a huge investment on your part to become a true master and leader in the field of ultrasound. You'll receive online content to consume in digestible bites, have a signed reading from online interactive sources, do scanning on your own, participate in ultrasound image review with us personally via Google Hangout, and spend one-on-one -on -one time with us via Google Hangout weekly to discuss the issues you're having. At the beginning of the 12 months of the Academy, you'll receive an iPad Mini loaded with tons of resources and ultrasound education that'll be your hub. You'll also receive online content trickled to you throughout the year so we don't overwhelm you all at once. You can use your own technology or the iPad for all our individualized teaching sessions. And every course we do, like Castle Fest or Alaska Fest, will be totally free and included in the Academy for you to come actually learn in person with us. Just to be very clear though, the Academy isn't free. And it isn't going to be cheap. We're only going to take a few people so that we can commit a lot of time to you. And we value our time. All of us have wives and small children we love spending time with, but this is important enough that we're committing to trying it for a few applicants. And if it's successful and rewarding as we think it'll be, then it'll totally be worth the time and investment on our part. So how much does it cost? Well, it depends. We're going to start taking applications immediately. We'll then give accepted individuals personalized quotes. One reason we're doing this is because we want to be able to offer scholarships to a couple of students from resource-limited settings where we anticipate the training will have a huge impact. If you're not from a resource-limited setting, though, it's not going to be cheap. So don't be surprised. This is an extremely premium experience that will be one of a kind. So it won't be for everyone. However, as we've already shown, we are committed to everyone and as much FOMAD as possible. So all the multimedia online content will be made available open source in the spirit of FOMED. We thought long and hard about that, and we can't ethically withhold what we consider extremely valuable education. We get too many inspiring stories about what you do with free education we put out there. It's really the additional mentorship that we'll be pricing. Our time, as we mentioned, is very scarce and valuable to us and our families. And while releasing the content free may not be the best business move, we think it's the right thing to do. All three of us believe in this free, open access medical education revolution. All right, guys, hold on, here it comes. Okay, sorry about that, but seriously, you can't talk over that drum riff. Please continue. Our hope and belief is that by the end of this year-long experience, you'll be exquisitely prepared to be a leader in ultrasound and your patients will be better off for it. This is definitely a big investment, but it's an investment in your career that we think will more than pay off for you, and as Matt said, for your patients. The application and link to the Academy site is on the ultrasoundpodcast.com website. We're accepting applications as of today, and the application deadline is June 30th. We'll be accepting applicants on a rolling basis as we receive applications, and an inaugural class will be set by August 1st, and we'll start the Academy on September 1st. Get your application in, and we can't wait to start this adventure with you. Oh yeah, it's going to be a ridiculous amount of fun also. You didn't think we'd leave the fun out, did you? You guys think the word party should be in there somewhere? The Ultrasound Party Academy? No, I think the party part's implied. They get it. They understand us. But, I mean, you say huge. <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs>
I mean, <laughs> it's not a W, Matt. <laughs> Is everyone done? <laughs> <laughs> not that long ago, we had a radius fracture reduction episode with Mark Goodman, and we promised you we were going to teach you how to do an ultrasound guided nerve block, a brachial plexus block for that reduction. And we are, very soon, in a few days actually. But first, we really wanted to give you some basics and background from the master Mike Stone. Now, you may have noticed that this is a huge file. Well, that's because it's in HD. It's straight from CastleFest, which is a totally high definition conference, and we couldn't bring ourselves to compress this thing down anymore. It's so beautiful. If you've been watching the YouTube videos from the webcam at CastleFest, please stop. We really should take those down, because we're going to be bringing you those same talk in high def, ridiculous quality that you will drool over while watching. Now, we were a little nervous about bringing Mike Stone to you in HD because, let's be honest, his looks are a little distracting. He's really put together more for a Hollywood leading man type role than educator. But we thought we'd take a chance. If he's too distracting, just tape a piece of paper over his face on the screen and focus on the ultrasound images. It's tough, but you can do it. Here you go. So, um, we're, we're going to talk about block principles and we're going to really, I, I've got, I think, an hour and a half to cover everything you need to know about ultrasound guided nerve blocks and an approach to the brachial plexus and all your peripheral nerves. And this is typically something that w I've done courses before with some of my, my friends and colleagues that it's about a, a day and a half long course and we'll do it in an hour and a half, it's totally fine. You'll, you'll learn everything you need to learn. Um, but it's uh, in all seriousness, we'll, we'll, I'm gonna give you a good introduction and, and then some real practical skills that you can go off and start using. Um, so we'll, we'll get started. The, the thing about nerve blocks is people get into a room and the first thing they want, I'm sure all of you guys are looking forward to now, is get to the pictures of where you put the probe and how you find the nerve and where you put the needle exactly and where does the anesthetic go. And then I'll have a bunch of questions for you about exactly you know, who you use this in, institutional problems, what meds you use, what needles you use, what syringes you use. That's all fine. I'm going to cover all of that stuff. But I think first we need to understand that nerve blocks <coughs> really are part of the picture. And that what you need to do is readdress the way that you look at taking care of people in pain. And then nerve blocks fit really well into a strategy that is sort of a holistic strategy of taking care of people in pain. So it's, it's part of the picture and it's part of a multimodal approach to, appro to taking care of acute pain. And I'm not talking about taking care of chronic pain. That's thankfully not typically my problem in the emergency department, but acute pain Instead of just doing what I learned to do, which is basically opioid monotherapy, right? You come in with pain, I give you an opioid, whether it's morphine or hydromorphone or fentanyl, and then when that doesn't work, I give you more opioid, and then that doesn't work, I give you maybe some Benadryl and some, you know, some, some anti-nausea medication, and then when that doesn't work, I just keep going until you're so asleep that you can't complain about pain. Um, and we know that multimodal analgesia and uh, uh, approach that incorporates different medications, different approaches, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, is far superior, and it's far superior in a number of ways. Opioid monotherapy, nausea, vomiting, over-sedation, respiratory depression, these are things that we see commonly. We see them commonly in elderly patients, but you can see it across the board. It's not, it's not a great um, approach to taking care of pain. And what we're finding is there's actually a ton of information that we don't know, and a ton of, of behaviors that we don't know about the way that opioids work. You look at people in chronic pain and you taper them off of their pain medications and their, their opioid medications and their pain scores go down. And it doesn't make any sense, but uh, there's this phenomenon that we're starting to realize and, and starting to recognize called opioid hyperalgesia and hypersensitivity. And this is a study, we're not going to go into this crazy volunteer study but basically in a ton of detail, but basically they injected healthy volunteers with capsaicin. Okay, so that, that hurts. And before they did that, they kind of burned them with this hot thermometer. Not enough to leave a mark, but enough that they got sort of a baseline pain scale. And they also went ahead and just brushed them with a Q-tip. So they were assessing for hyperalgesia, for how much, it, you know, how much a painful stimulus hurts, and then for allodynia. So, you know, does something that shouldn't be painful be painful? And what was fascinating about this was they, they went ahead and got a baseline pain scale after they injected them with capsaicin. They started them on a remifentanyl infusion, so a strong opioid but with a short half-life. Their pain scores went down initially with the remifentanyl. So over here on this part of the curve, they're feeling better with the remi here. And then as they cut it off, their pain scores gradually rose and rose and rose, far above what it was before they got any remifentanyl. 
and the areas that, was pain, that were painful to them expanded over the course of, of several hours. So there is actually acute opioid withdrawal syndromes that we don't see, or at least we, we don't recognize, and that I was always taught that doesn't happen. If somebody's in acute pain, just give them a bunch of opioids. Don't worry about withdrawal and tolerance and that sort of stuff. And truly, tolerance doesn't happen acutely, but withdrawal really does. So we've been looking at some of the data recently, and multimodal approaches that limit the amount of opioid analgesia actually decrease length of stay postoperatively, decrease ICU days in people who went to the unit. So we, we know it works. We know that there's decreased inflammation, there's decreased incidence of opioid-induced hyperalgesia, there's decreased incidence of complex regional pain syndrome, of PTSD. Most of this comes from the military data. And now a lot of uh, forward-deployed units, if you're injured, you actually get a multimodal approach. We'll talk about what that is, but it includes a peripheral nerve block, multiple different agents for pain medication and pain management, and you, gone are the days of auto-injecting yourself or your buddy in the field with morphine. Okay, so one of the first things we can do is just be compassionate people and good doctors and splint things and immobilize them and ice them and elevate them and practice good compassionate care and make patients trust in us and take care of their emotional concerns. And that's actually important and obviously that's a, just a part of taking care of people that we often sometimes hurry through. Um, identify people early on who are a good, candidate for a good candidate for blocks. This person comes into your ED with a distal femur fracture. You could do an amazing job taking care of their pain with a femoral nerve block. But if you do it four hours later after they've been transported back and forth to x-ray and they've been in pain sitting there, there is this, this wind-up phenomenon where they get, the pain gets harder and harder to treat the longer it's left untreated. So you do want to get on top of it early. Now, you don't have to use all of these things, but typically a combination of an NSAID the people who, who really research um, acute pain management from anesthesiology will say you should use a COX-2 inhibitor. Um, acetaminophen, uh, which is, uh, or, or paracetamol. Um, ketamine, which I think many of us are big fans of using for analgesia, but low doses, so sort of 0.1 to 0.3 mg per kg in non-dissociative doses. Uh, gabapentin is actually a wonderful uh, acute analgesic. And then things like dexmedetomidine and clonidine work really well too. I don't have a lot of experience with those. But you guys are here to, to learn about blocks, so we'll, we'll talk about blocks. Um, this is one component, though, of the overall strategy, and I just want you to have that in mind. So there are certainly patients in the ED who I do a nerve block, and that's the only management that I do for them, but they're really few and far between. It's things like, you know, palm lacerations. I might just do a nerve block. But anything beyond that, I really want you to consider what else you can do, multimodal approach to, to provide good pain, pain control. All right, <clears throat> monitoring. So... All you really need to do is pull up the ASA, the, American, uh, the Anesthesia Society of America's uh, standards for basic anesthetic monitoring, and follow them. Because they're not overly onerous, they're actually quite reasonable. And the first thing you need to do, the only thing you need to do is be perceived as a bunch of cowboys who are randomly injecting people with large doses of anesthesia off of monitors, and you'll rapidly find out that your hospital no longer wants you to do blocks. Um, it's really straightforward. Put them on a cardiac monitor, put them on pulse oximetry, have your blood pressure monitored every five minutes, so they're on an automated cuff that's just cycling every five minutes, and have IV access. Now, do I do this for every single nerve block? I don't put people on a monitor for a digital block. I don't think any of you guys put people on a monitor for a digital block. I don't personally put people on monitors for ankle or wrist blocks. Um, anything above the elbow, above the knee, my patients are monitored. Okay, and I think you need to talk to the people in your institution and make sure that you, they're happy with how you're doing this, but you should definitely be monitoring people. And why are we monitoring people? We're monitoring people because of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Okay, so last is the thing that you need to be very concerned about and knowledgeable about if you're going to start using local anesthetics in significantly high doses. This was a much bigger concern when you were blindly putting a needle or putting a needle with a nerve stimulator into tissues and injecting 20 mLs of lidocaine and 20 mLs of bupivacaine and a 40 mL bolus of anesthetic, and you weren't really sure where it was going. You were guessing well where it was going because you had a nerve stimulator and you could elicit twitch and that kind of stuff. Um, this isn't as much of a concern anymore because you're going to be able to do all the blocks we're talking about with really 10, maybe 15 mLs of, of anesthetic. And for everyone who trained before amiodarone was pushed upon us, we used to give 100 milligrams of lidocaine intravenously to people with pulses who were talking to us. So, and we're not giving it intravenously. So th it's really, there, there's the historical perspective on last. There's always the possibility that something can go wrong, so you need to know about it. But it, it isn't this um, giant elephant in the room they have to be constantly concerned about. 
So this is a must read, and this is in the PDF that you guys are getting. It's only a few pages long, but this is the American Society of Regional Anesthesia's practice advisory on LAST. And this has a bunch of pearls in it, like pre-treating people with benzodiazepines to raise the seizure threshold. Monitoring, how quickly you should inject, three to five ml aliquots, wait a couple of minutes between your injections. Talk to your patients, monitor them for symptoms of LAST. What to do if they develop LAST, which in, is infusion of lipid emulsion, and you can go ahead and look at the protocols. I'm not going to cover them in detail, because you're never going to cause this. But I think it's a must read. And why do I say you're never going to cause it? This is um, from a group out of Dartmouth. They're very active in regional anesthesia. It's anesthesiologists. Incidence of LAST and postoperative neurologic symptoms, which we'll talk about also, with almost 13,000 ultrasound-guided nerve blocks. And I would say guess how many, incident, how many cases of LAST they had, but then you'd guess zero. And they had one. And their one case of local anesthetic systemic toxicity in nearly 13,000 patients was in someone with a continuous nerve block catheter in which they were using bupivacaine. And they had inadvertently passed the catheter into a vessel. Okay, So not one single shot block, meaning you inject and you take the needle out and you're done with your block, in their entire registry. So I'm not saying that we couldn't figure out a way to get it wrong. But it's, it's really not likely to happen. Postoperative neurologic symptoms. Um, it's the same study. You look at this and, um, you know, what makes you likely to have a postoperative neurologic symptom? Nobody knows. We used to think that if you inject it into the nerve, that's why you got nerve damage. And that's a really, really basic and incomplete understanding of what happens. We actually have a bunch of groups that advocate injecting under the epineurium and into the nerve itself and that you get a better block with faster onset and there's no higher complications. ASRA hasn't endorsed that yet. I don't try to inject into the nerve. I have unintentionally injected into the nerve many times, and I think it, the, my experience reflects that completely. The block sets really quickly, they get really numb, it's really effective, and it wears off and they're totally fine. So who knows, but the things that do contribute to postoperative neurologic symptoms, people with bad neuropathy and, and, and poor microvascular disease, so brittle diabetics with already pre-existing neuropathy, those are people you gotta be really concerned about whether you wanna block. You never wanna inject against high pressure, so if you're trying to inject and it feels like your needle's clogged, that's a problem. If you're eliciting a paresthesia, a painful paresthesia, as you're injecting, you need to stop, reposition your needle. So there's some good basic technique you can do to minimize this. But some of it may not be from the injection. Some of it may be all of this is post-operative neurologic symptoms. They had an orthopedic surgery. They were positioned in a certain way. Maybe some of it's compression neuropathy. Maybe some of it's due to the procedure they underwent. Some of it's just bad luck, and people may react to local anesthetic. The overall incidence was incredibly low if you look at these numbers. The most common ones, that, and, and really the ones on the right here, are the only ones you really worry about. So here's all the different types of blocks they did, how many of them they did. There was one long-lasting post-operative neurologic symptom in nearly 5,000 femoral blocks, but five nearly long-lasting ones in the interscaling block, even though they did only half as many and less than half. So if you look by location, there are places that seem like it may be more common than others. Okay, that's enough about the overview stuff and safety. Let's get into talking about what you actually need to do blocks. So there's a few different components of what you need. You need an ultrasound system, you need a transducer, and you'll need to sterilely prep it in some way. We'll talk about it in detail. Um, a syringe and a needle, okay? So the transducer, if you're doing a single shot block, it's completely reasonable to go ahead and cover it with a sterile adhesive dressing like this and to not do a full sterile probe sheath. If you are putting a catheter into somebody, which I know you guys are gonna be going off and running and doing, um, you're gonna need a full sterile probe sheath because you're putting a foreign body into somebody. It's just like doing a central line. You need to be completely sterile. What's nice about these uh, um, adhesive dressings is they stretch so tightly over the ultrasound transducer, you don't need gel between them and the transducer. You can just stretch this over the transducer and put surgery lube or some sort of sterile lubricant on as the uh, conduction agent to touch the skin. Obviously, you'll go ahead and prep the skin with an um, antiseptic solution if it's chlorhexidine, betadine, whatever you're using. The syringe. These are really nice, these disposable control syringes. You don't need one of these. You can use an absolutely, totally standard syringe. There's nothing special about it. I find that when people are learning to do blocks, they, if they're going to use a hand-on syringe technique, and we'll talk about the alternative in a second, um, you, they, they find it a lot easier to focus on placing the needle when they're not so focused on aspirating. And having that, that ease of aspiration and injection is kind of nice. You get a lot of tactile feedback from that injection and how much pressure you're having to put in. My county hospital was able to stock these, so they're not expensive. 
um, and they're disposable, they're nice. If you do use a hand-on needle technique, um, there's no syringe, you're holding the hub of the needle, and there's extension tubing off to a syringe, and you have someone else actually aspirating and injecting. There is one description of a way to do a hand-on needle technique where you do your own aspirating and injection. It's one of my favorite studies because they call it, it's, a, it's actually in the medical literature and it's called the Jedi Grip. And you can, uh, I'll send you guys the reference if you want. It's pretty complicated. I, I think Yoda could do it, but I don't think I could do it. Um, <clears throat> this is hand-on needle, okay? So you've got hand-on transducer and then hand here on the hub of the needle. Obviously, you get a lot of fine control and you feel things very easily and you actually will feel fascial clicks and you'll feel loss of resistance and a lot of the stuff we used to depend on. And here's the extension tubing going off to a syringe. And here's the connection for the nerve stimulator that you don't use because you're not using a nerve stimulator. But don't worry, just leave it hanging. Um, these are blunt tipped, okay, these needles. And they're sort of a, a different bevel than the typical quinky needle that you use for everything in the ED. And there is some concern that a sharp cutting needle, like the regular standard needles we have, could induce more nerve damage. There's no live data on this. There's in vitro data that a blunt tip needle is more likely to cause damage to the fascicles inside the nerve, the part we care about, than a sharp tip needle, but less likely to penetrate a nerve than a sharp tip needle. So I can't give you a great answer that's evidence-based here. I wouldn't stop doing blocks because you don't stock nerve block needles. But if you stock them, I'd probably use them. And that's what I use. So, but at the same time, if we're out, I'll totally grab a quinky needle and use it. So, and, and there are certainly people who do blocks routinely with those. Um, your ultrasound machine. We're not gonna, we, you know, we talked a little bit the first day about machine basics. You need a machine that has high, a high frequency transducer so you can look at things close to the skin surface. You need a machine that has, um, Really, that's it. You need a high-frequency transducer. I mean, you, it's nice to have a machine that has compound imaging, which is sort of, we mentioned briefly, but multiple scan planes off of the axis, and it averages the, the returning echoes and helps to sort of clean up structures. And this is the radial nerve here, uh, just above the elbow. And, you know, it pops out from the surrounding musculature really, really easily. There is an associated artery here. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's nice to have a newer generation machine, but we started doing blocks in 2005 in RED with old systems that are now three, four generations old, and they work just fine. All right, medications. Um, you know, if you have access to the new fancy amide anesthetics like ropivacaine and mepivacaine that are less cardiotoxic, that's great. Um, they're more expensive. I've never been in a place that stocked them routinely in the ED. Um, if you're going to start learning how to do blocks, I think you have two options. Your first is to use lidocaine, just regular old lidocaine. And why? Because it's got a pretty good safety uh, profile. You're really unlikely to cause any dysrhythmias or make someone really sick with lidocaine. Bupivacaine, on the other hand, uh, is not well tolerated by the cardiovascular system. And if you look back at the cases of local anesthetic systemic toxicity, almost all of them are bupivacaine related. Um, so I really don't let people use bupivacaine for blocks in, who are working with me until they've had a good six months to a year's worth of experience. And I feel like this person really knows how to recognize an intravascular injection. And I'm not going to be terrified about them doing a block with bupivacaine. But it's an interesting concept to pause on for a second because you'd never take somebody to the operating room if you were an anesthesiologist and give them a block that would last for one hour and then wear off completely, right? Because you need to have them completely, you know, anesthetic. They need to be insensate, able to go through their entire invasive cutting, spreading, you know, stitching surgeries and tolerating it well. We have such different goals as emergency providers. You want to take somebody's pain from an extreme level and bring it down to a manageable level. Maybe go ahead and facilitate a painful procedure. But if you don't get them to zero pain, if you get them down to you know, just barely noticeable pressure and discomfort, that's a huge success for you. Whereas in the operating room, it would be a huge failure, and you have to go ahead and induce general. So we have a very different perspective than our friends in anesthesiology on how to do this. And as a result, there's a medication that you can consider using when you're first starting that they would never consider using for this, which is chloroprocaine. And chloroprocaine is an ester. It's not an amide. Slightly increased risk of allergic reactions from esters than amides, but Novocaine is an ester. It gets used a lot still. And because it's an ester, it'll be hydrolyzed by acetylcholinesterase. And if you really screw up and get it into the bloodstream, it'll be broken down. And you're almost, it's, you, you know, nobody likes to say it's impossible, but it's kind of impossible to see how you could induce local anesthetic systemic toxicity with an agent that gets into the bloodstream and gets hydrolyzed. 
Now, as a, the thing about it is it'll, it'll get on set in about 5, 10 minutes, and it'll be gone in about 35, 40 minutes. So it's not it's something that ever gets used by the anesthesiologist for single shot nerve blocks because there's no case that short. They couldn't even get them into the OR and started into the case that, I mean, they can get them started, but there's no cases that short. The, um, for us, on the other hand, if you have a glenohumeral dislocation or an ankle dislocation or a large abscess that needs to be opened, that's perfect. 35 minutes is plenty of time. So it's something that you can consider using too. So when you're starting, I'd say lidocaine or chloroprocaine, when you gain familiarity, can probably move up to bupivacaine and get people longer lasting analgesia. Okay, nerves themselves. This is about as thorough of an understanding of the nerve that you need to have. Um, the epineurium is the outermost layer. We've got the individual fascicles within the nerve. They, each one has its own perineurium. And then the nerves are typically sandwiched between the fascia. These stars don't exist in real life, but they're targets for you on where you might want to put your needle. So you don't have to come right up against the nerve under the fascia. You can go next to it between the fascia layers and the anesthetic will spread in that space and you can have an added measure of protection that you're not spearing the nerve and going ahead and hitting it directly. You don't want to get under the perineurium, which is the blue. Sometimes people will get under the epineurium and again, like I said, that it really people tend to tolerate it well. There's a great study where they did uh, ultrasound measurements of the sciatic nerve in the popliteal fossa they put the probe away and did a nerve stimulator sciatic block that worked well. They were happy with the blocks. Everyone tolerated them well. At the conclusion of the block, they re-ultrasounded the sciatic nerves, and about 75% of them were intraneural injections. Everybody did fine. Everyone had great anesthesia. Nobody had side effects. So again, we don't understand it well. I wouldn't target the inside of the nerve, but I also wouldn't um, you know, self-flagellate if you actually hit it. Okay. We talked about this in the, in the DVT uh, hands-on sessions previously. But we've got vessels down here, and we never really paid much attention to what was sitting on top of the vessels. But this hyperechoic round structure with internal hypoechoic um, shapes in here, this is, this is the tibial nerve. Out here is the common peroneal nerve. We'll, t we'll cover this in more detail when we get into the sciatic, but that's what they look like below the clavicle. They look bright with little black dots. Above the clavicle, they look more black and with some surrounding white stuff. And we'll show you that when we talk about the brachial plexus. So the technique, I think you need to hold the probe in a way that's conducive to getting a good image. Um, nerves are really sensitive to what angle you insinate them at. And that's, um, that's something we'll look at in a second. So you, you want to have fine control over the transducer. And it's probably the only time, other than lumbar puncture when I'm scanning, where I scan holding it with both hands. Just to do the survey and to actually find the nerve and be happy with where I'm looking. This is this property of anisotropy, where if you don't insinate the nerve at the right angle, it won't be visible very well. Tendons have this much more than nerves, and you'll see that later. But nerves also have it, and especially if there's no tendons around, you'll notice it. So right up here, that bright white structure there, that's the median nerve. And as you fan on and off plane from it, you see that it becomes bright. It's pretty easily visualized here. And then as we tilt the probe, it disappears. So finding that right angle to insinate it at is important and you're gonna um, have a much better time finding these structures. And we talked about targeting the fascia, okay? So we're doing an in-plane block here. We've got the ulnar nerve sitting up here, and the provider's going right here at the, at the edge of the fascia. They're not going right up against the nerve. And as the injection starts, you're seeing that local anesthetic spread in that groove and just dissecting out the space around the nerve. And you know this person's a um, perfectionist and wants to really dissect it out completely. You don't need to cover it on all of its surfaces to get a great block. But certainly, if you go ahead and really just stick with it, this whole thing took about 30 seconds. And this is one of the beauties of regional anesthesia with ultrasound, is if any of you learned how to do nerve blocks um, with landmark techniques like I did, you would do them and then walk out of the room kind of quietly crossing your fingers that it was going to work. And when you walk out of the room having seen this, there's no question they're going to be numb by the time you come back. So it's very satisfying, and you can tell you got a good block. Institutional logistics are going to differ, obviously, uh, tremendously between what kind of places you work in. In my experience, the small community hospitals where I've worked, I've had the easiest time doing blocks. The large academic centers with multiple training programs and academic anesthesiologists and orthopedics, I've had the harder time doing it. Um, ultimately, 
You need to find out what your resources are. Hopefully you have a, an ultrasound system. You have some people trained at your institution who are comfortable doing this or at least enthusiastic about learning. You can absolutely go take a course. There's a number of them. There's one through uh, some of the emergency medicine meetings. There's uh, good anesthesia courses. Do you have an anesthesiologist in your institution who's a friendly face and a colleague who might help you let you tag along and, and watch him do, or her do some blocks in the operating room and get comfortable? So that's important to kind of find out what your resources are and do a needs assessment. You need to involve all the players. So here's a rare picture of the empty trauma bay in my old emergency department. But it's nice to have the trauma team, trauma surgeons, the anesthesiologists, the pharmacists, the orthopedists, and the emergency physicians or family practice docs all meet together and say, these are the types of patients we think will, will be good candidates for blocks. This is the sort of exam we're going to document before we do blocks. Here are our contraindications and really have something worked out so there's no you did what to my patient kind of experiences, and everybody gets on the same page to, to do the best to provide good care. Um, you need to address concerns. People are going to want to know, well, what about compartment syndrome? What about local anesthetic systemic toxicity? What about postoperative neurologic symptoms? What are you going to do if this happens or that happens? Are you going to block open fractures? Are you only going to block closed fractures? There's no right answers to any of this stuff, but you need to get together with these people and get all the stakeholders together and talk about it. And you'll have a much easier time if you do that up front. You also need to talk about how you're going to document um, and standardize a block protocol. So it's a sort of, you, you find somebody, you get IV access, who, need, who would benefit from a block, you get IV access and put them on a monitor, you start multimodal analgesia, you talk to them about the block and get informed consent and go on and on and on through a very standardized protocol so that you're always doing things correctly, not forgetting key steps and hitting all of the, the marks along the way. I find, excuse me, in general, with the block, obviously it gets documented in the medical record, but I write with a surgical marking pen on the patient. My orthopedists uh, rarely actually look at the medical record, but do go and examine the patients. And um, you know, we've had some very interesting cases where that didn't happen, and people thought there was an associated spinal cord injury because the patient didn't complain of any pain when they were getting their fractures set, and it's embarrassing when they think your patient's paralyzed because they're actually just comfortable. Um, so uh, you want to have a good block protocol in place. Okay, questions on the logistics and sort of the, the overall safety and supply concerns about blocks. Okay, so um, we talked about multi multimodal analgesia, we talked about safety issues, we talked about the general supplies that you'll need and determining your um, capacity at your institution or in your clinical practice. And that's really all I have for you guys about the overall picture of blocks. We'll go ahead and transition on the nerve block marathon into um, the brachial plexus we'll talk about next. All right, it looks like you've got some work to do. These podcasts have never been just for fun. We know people always have disclaimers about don't try this at home or not meant to be medical advice, but we think disclaimers are for sissies and prudent physicians who have learned the hard way. Fortunately for us, we haven't learned the hard way yet. So we say go try this. Work at your institution to get these protocols set up and pave the way for yourself to do this. It's fun, but more importantly, it's good care. Don't be scared. You can do this. Now, we're going to give you a few days to go ahead and start working on some of this, and then we're going to come back at you very soon with some actual how-to break your plexus blocks. Seriously, nobody teaches this better than Mike Stone, and you're going to love his brachial plexus block talk. Coming soon. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs, let us know how you feel about it.